And you, you can hear me now. Yes, indeed. Thanks, Alex. So that is great. Um, it was a very enjoyable... Uh, sorry, Danny, how long have I got? About 10 minutes, Alan, if that's okay. To speak for. So, uh, vir virtual museum t turning the vir turning the virtual real, and I, I, th I think that the sort of idea behind this um, title, um, with respect to two virtual museums um, and and time travel and the like, it was really just based based upon the observation that. We we talk about the the virtual and the real. We talk about there being a a virtual world and uh, talk about there being a, a real world. Um, but actually, you know, how much is that true these days? I mean, it was certainly true, you know, for people of of my generation, where the 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 internet um, and 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 the virtual and all the things that came with it was something that was new that was added into um into society um and that it made therefore made a lot of sense to talk about um museums and virtual museums for example um but that now i don't think that it really does make sense to talk about um virtual museums um because you know at the, at the end of the day um the the digital world is part and parcel of um our day-to-day -day experience it, it's it's part of what happens um you know the i don't know my, my iphone monitors the amount of screen time that i ha have that i'm using um and so every day you you're using that and i i think that this is you know, there used to be the debates about um, accessibility with regard to, you know, if we do things digital, does, does this mean that um, we're going to be excluding people? We, you know, people who are, aren't digital natives aren't going to have access to to some of the products that we're that, that we're making. And I, I think that in a in a sense, we need to kind of turn it turn it around, turn it back the other way, and say that you know the, the virtual is part and parcel of our day-to-day -day experience and you know therefore for heritage to be you know absent from that means that we're going to be missing out a huge um opportunity for communicating and for communicating and engaging um and so in a sense what the it kind of talks about what the challenge is what the challenge is for um kind of kind of virtual and virtual museums because the you know, in the in the past, and and um, Eric Champion pointed to sort of some of the previous um, projects, such as VR projects from the sixties and um, virtual reality uh, projects from the more 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 recent past. But by and large, they they have been you know quite high profile um, projects, uh, prestige projects. And not very much integrated into the day-to-day -day life of, of of museums. And I think that what we're what the challenge is increasingly is, is that how can we make um, digital technologies, virtual technologies, um, and their use part and parcel of the day-to-day uh, -day practice of um, of museums? How can we make it so that um, it's not a idea that there is a separate virtual museum and there's a separate real world, but rather that when we're developing um, exhibits and uh, ex exhibitions, then the role that digital plays in those is is one that is considered and and is part of, and it is something that can um, be done on a day to day on on a, on a day to day basis, and I think that. So what we've been looking at then in terms of virtual museums, making them is um, rather than seeing it as being um, a, just a digital way of presenting um, 
some heritage, whether it be sets of images or or videos or even or even three D models, but rather thinking about the, the virtual museum as mirroring and and um, engaging with the different um, aspects that you would associate with um, with with the real world with a real world museum, you know, and so that although. Um, and and so what that would mean would be that as well as um, having the capacity to create an exhibit or having the capacity for digital to be used in the in as part and parcel of the creation of exhibits that they can also um, be used as part of the training process as part of the um, knowledge exchange and building of, of capacity so that so it becomes part and parcel of that um, and at, so you've got the exhibition side you've got the um, training side you, you've also got the archive side and so developing um, metadata and, and archives that can hold these, these, these resources and connect them in with the different ways in which people um, communicate um and, and engage with heritage and i think that the you know the experience of um covid19 or not so much the experience of covid19 but the experience of the response to covid19 has really moved um the world of um, heritage and and of virtual museums within that world um on quite considerably so that whereas because you know, with the impact of of COVID, um, it kind of immediately removed um, people's ability to engage with um, heritage in the physical in the physical dimension. Um, and the response to this for a lot of people was to um, look at um, virtual ways of engaging with heritage. So we saw a massive increase in the um, use of social media a massive increase in the searches on google for virtual mu virtual museums um uh blossoming of live virtual tours and live events in the heritage sector and so on so we had a big turn and change towards um towards heritage and i think a lot of people are asking well you know what's going to happen now you know hopefully with the um decline of COVID and its influence on, on society. Are we going to go back to the previous um, normal? Is the sort of turn to digital going to be a thing of the thing of the past? And I, I think not. And I think not for um, three reasons, basically. I mean, so, so I think that the, the first reason is that, you know, over the last 20 years, in particular, there's been a, a transformation in the way in which we use digital so that uh, the, the, the penetration of smartphones, the number of pe people that have them, it means that, um, and also of computer games, it means that people who engage with heritage organizations um, who, who go to a museum, um, a, a very high proportion of, of them will have the set of digital literacies which enables them to engage with um, digital, digital interpretation. Um, so it means that it's possible to make a digital exhibit um, and to place it into a museum. And unlike a computer game where, um, you know, with a computer game, you can expect for someone to spend some significant period of time. And I mean, in, in effect, sometimes the best computer games are ones that do take months to learn. Um, you know, there's a whole learning process. You learn how to play the game and you learn how to win the game and all of that stuff can take a considerable investment of time, energy and, and effort. But when you're using digital technologies for, from a heritage perspective inside of a museum, you know, you're not wanting your um, visitors to, to, you know, have to learn how to play, how to play the exhibit. You're, you're wanting them to be able to walk up and to be able to use that. Um, that exhibit and, and that has been true um, way before um, way before COVID but I think what 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 COVID um, but I think that it is is certainly more true um, more true today that the digital literacies that exist in society mean that um, creating digital exhibits exhibitions 
um, can reach audiences, whether it be through, and here I think it's one of three ways. So um, through visiting a, a museum and receiving digital content. Now, whether that be personalized interpretation on your phone, um, an immersive exhibit, but different ways of enhancing the visit to the, to the, to the museum. Um, the second being the um, Museum Without Walls, using mobile devices to extend the reach of the museum so that it can create, curate within the, the hinterland. And this is an example of this we um, did, we showed with working with um, Jackie and the Timespan Museum, um, developing uh, an app which showed us what, what it was like to be in the uh, uh, Strath of Kildonan, you know, at the time of the Highland clearances and, and previously. So there's this enhancing a visit to a museum, there's a sort of museum without walls. And then there's the um, question of how to then take that museum experience um, and to make it accessible, make it accessible from the home, make it accessible from the, from the classroom and so on. And, and I think that um, that, that is a challenge, you know, because, um, and we, we've worked with, we work with some um, kind of uh, to, on the point of accessibility to try and work with open source um, technologies. So like Omica is a uh, kind of virtual museum type, type technology. Um, and we pair that up with the international image interoperability framework for galleries and leaflets for, for maps um, and um, Unreal Engine to create um, immersive environments that support virtual time travel. So there's all these sort of activities and types of, um, and types of exhibits. And um, what one of the challenges is, is to make all of these available, you know, um, you know, through a click, and one one of the ways in which we we do that is by making um you know making your virtual um, reconstruction based upon historical historical data in a in a game engine, but then taking whole load of three sixty photographs and you using that to make a virtual tour, and then the virtual tour is directly accessible via a click on the website. So you're just sort of one click away from um, moving into the past. Of course, that's probably not as immersive as the as the game experience, so that doing an installation in a museum or being able to download um, to play at to play at home through a headset headset or something like that is also of 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 uh, of, of great benefit. But you can see that there's these um, three things really. You know, virtual museum in the landscape, cityscape, virtual museum enhancing the museum at home uh, in, in in on site. Uh, and then the, making the, the, all this stuff accessible um, in, in the home. And I, I think that, you know, we talked earlier on about there being a technology curve about the, the capabilities of devices um, increasing as, as time goes by. And although, you know, in the past, there has been VR since the 60s, it's not been accessible VR. It's not been something that you can do um, on a device that everybody has got in their pocket. It's not something that millions of people have access to. It's not something that one person had access to or 10 people had access to around the world. And so that's what has really, really changed. And I think that, you know, Pokemon was, was great. I enjoyed, um, enjoyed playing Pokemon. And, and that kind of ushers in the, the age of augmented, um, augmented reality. And people have talked about augmented reality for a long time, but, you know, one of the things about heritage is, is that in order for it to be, or often in order for it to be effective, it needs to be high fidelity. There needs to be a level of, um, of, of, of realism. There's, there, there's a space and a function for cartoons, um, you know, type things, but there's something to be said about um, being able to um, realistically portray portray the past and in order to do that using augmented reality we still have a fair way to go in terms of the um, capabilities of mobile devices and in order to be able to provide full immersion and uh, six degrees of freedom moving around and, and so on as if in a computer game at high fidelity we still have quite quite a way to go the headsets that we have today <coughs> in one sense are great um, you know, but they do look a little bit, I, I do think they look like 
sort of mobile phones from the 90s you know they're sort of clunky um and 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 quite and, and quite big they kind of do their job um but they're not the most elegant things in the world and i think that you know just as mobile phones have become um you know slimline and desirable and um all all of those things so so headsets we're going to see them get smaller we're going to see them get more powerful um and as has been said you know that that's a there's then an issue with the platforms because platforms will keep changing as time as time goes on but that's not necessarily the case with the media if we can um create 3d media digital representations and so on and archive them and i think what we have to do is we have to learn to develop um for reuse you know the the gone are the days when um we should go well, oh what we need to do now is we need to have an app or what we need to do now is we need to have a um a web page what we need to do now is we need to have a virtual reality so no what we need to do is to, to have an a subject and we need to create media that's relevant to that subject that can be used in a museum at home context that can be used to enhance a visit to a museum that can be used in the um uh in in the landscape that we can access via a mobile phone that can be used in a headset that can be an immersive immersive exhibit so i think that it's you know it, it's about designing for um for reuse i think it, it's going to become increasingly um increasingly important because the platforms will change um but that doesn't mean that you know if, if we create a digital 3d model of uh historic artifact you know whether we're viewing that on our phone today or whether we're viewing it on the phone in on a different device in in 10 years time um the fundamentals of that artifact are going to stay are going to stay the same and so the, the media and the representations that we create um have the potential of you know obviously we want to avoid the um what's happened in the past where things get locked in um, and so I think that means we need to look at open formats. Um, we need to look at um, open open standards um, and avoid being tied into a particular company. Okay. Um, yeah, that, I'm I'm happy with that. Um, we are as well, Adam. Thank you. I say I'm happy with that. I could have done better, but you know. <laughs> Not at all. Thank you, Alan. And in my haste on thinking on my feet earlier, I forgot to introduce you. So uh, to most of us, Alan doesn't need an introduction. But uh, for those of you that might have just seen him for the first time, he's a um, lecturer in the School of Computer Science at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland and uh, is an expert in all things disruptive technologies, particularly in the context of culture and heritage. Um, I am going to throw it open for a moment. I know we're a little bit behind, but that's OK. Uh, to any questions that anybody might have either online or in the room? I ask. Certainly. Uh, Michelle is coming at you here, Alan. Hi, Michelle. Hi, Alan. Um, I'm just wondering, do you think without these virtual museums that the physical museums are actually dead in the water? Is it something that will die out if you don't have the virtual museum element of it as well? Did you hear that, Alan? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I did hear that, and yeah. um, no, I don't think that they will. Um, but I, I think that the, that they, you know, that, that it will get to the point where, you know, if if there's a museum without um, a digital footprint, you know, it will just be a bit weird. It's like why 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 would there not be some sort of digital? I mean, I, I think I think it's probably true now. You know pretty much all museums have some sort of social media presence have some sort of web has some sort of web presence so i i i think that um i i think it's just you know in the in the same way as um for the better or for worse you know the digital is part and parcel if i keep saying part and parcel it's part of our lives um then it, it's also going to be part of the way in which heri heritage works and the way in which museums work um but you know, if 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 there's a a, a a museum will be a, I don't think that the virtual can replace what a museum has to has to offer. It can it can enhance it, but um, there's something um, 
to be said about being, you know, in the physical presence of old objects, um, uh, you know, as a gateway to understanding and thinking about and being stimulated about um, how people lived in lived lived in the past. So I wouldn't want to um, disrespect that, you know, at, at all. I think museums have have a value. Um, so I don't think they'll be dead in the water, but I, I think that they, they just will have a di digital dimension. And so the question is really. More, what, what is the best digital dimension? What is the best way to handle the digital for a particular um, for a particular museum? Superb, thank you, Alan. Uh, I was told during Alan's uh, presentation there that Halfer's presentation was pre-recorded, so I am now going to make an attempt to share that with the audience. Wrong one. So, uh, so happy to be here with you, even though it's not live. Uh, this is a recording of my presentation. Uh, and I'm extremely honored to be able to show you this project that I've been working on here in East Iceland for uh, a little over two years now. This is called East Iceland 360 degrees tour. Uh, and it's, it covers most of, most of East Iceland except for the municipality of Múlathing. Uh, municipality, sorry, of Fjarðabyð, but hopefully they will join the project later on. Uh, this is a virtual tour uh, made of 360 degrees panoramic images taken from a drone uh, and now there are uh, about 200 images uh, all linked together to make a yeah, virtual flying tour all over the area. The, the tour is uh, started as a as a basically a uh, hobby, a hobby project for me. I come from the town of Borgafjörður Eystri, and I was uh, taking a lot of images there. And then I started taking drone images, and then I found out that you could make pretty cool panoramic images easily from a pretty cheap cheap drone actually. So. Uh, it got a lot of attention and the municipality of uh, Mula think asked me to make a virtual tour made of uh, images like this and later on Fjostal's rapper joined the project. So this is the starting page of the tour. I used the Kula platform to combine the images and in my opinion Kula is uh, really good platform, it's uh, user friendly, and you can easily share your tour and your project with clients, both as direct links or embedded iframe codes into web pages. So you can choose in the beginning where you start. Uh, I'm going to start here in my hometown of Borgafjörður. And you can rotate the images, look all around. You can jump to the next, next image. And you should always be facing the same direction as the link that you clicked. Uh, I think about the images basically as like an empty canvas. So you can add on all desired information. But in my opinion, you shouldn't uh, put too much into it and I think it's always better to uh, yeah to have the pictures saying what need to be said but you can easily put uh, linked web pages into the Kula flat platform so this is our uh, visit page in Borgafjörður Eystri 
So if they update anything on this page, it will change automatically inside of the virtual tour. You can easily embed, for example, YouTube videos. You can even add virtual tour inside of virtual tours. Uh, for example, this is a very popular tourist destination in my town called Lindabaki, which is an example of a turf house like people used to live in Iceland. And here I am combining an inside virtual tour inside of a drone tour. So you can go inside houses, you can take a look and go back out. Uh, also, if you want to look inside of the church in the village. So those are two separated uh, virtual tours, but you can easily combine them together in Kula. For uh, the inside photography, I use Rick of Theta Zeta 1, which is an awesome camera that doesn't cost that much, but the benefit of this camera, it shoots raw images, so you can easily adjust the images afterwards in post-production in, in Lightroom. Uh, the drone images are all taken from Mavic Air 2S, which is a, yeah, it would not never be considered to be an expensive drone. But also the benefit of this drone, it can take uh, raw images so you can manipulate the colors and the light balance and everything afterwards. If you're using a drone like this, I strongly recommend you don't just take the images as a JPEG images. Always use the capability of the drone to shoot raw because it's much easier to yeah, get a professional looking images afterwards with the raw files. To stitch the files uh, from the drone, we have 26 uh, separated images. So you have to stitch them together. And I use a program called PT GUI to stitch uh, the images together. And I strongly recommend to use that program. Uh, as I said, this is an ongoing project. Uh, hopefully this summer we will add uh, images of places that we weren't able able to visit uh, last summer or the year before it takes a lot of time it you need to have the perfect conditions each and every time you can't be having too much wind or it can't be foggy and it's always foggy in east iceland so hopefully you will take a look at this virtual tour uh, I assume that you will be given a direct link to view it. And feel free to send me an email if you want to ask more questions about this kind of uh, virtual tour. And yes, thank you very much. And uh, thanks for this opportunity. In your absence, Halfer, that one's for you. Uh, let me stop sharing. Um, I had the pleasure of see, meeting Halfer at an event recently online, and I got a, a deep dive into some of the stuff that he's just showing you there. It's really impressive, and, and I have to say it's, it's second to none. Um, I, we're, we're actually going to, uh, our group is going to East Iceland later this evening, and we hope to see the real version of what you've just seen right there um, uh, later on and tomorrow. Um, without further ado, our next speaker in this session is Helen Jackson. She's a senior lecturer in the Interactive Media at the School of Communications and Media with Ulster University. Let me just... Cue up your presentation here. Oops. 
screen. Yes. Thank you. I didn't realize there was any animations on this. I hoped it would just come up. Um, anyway, we'll see how we go. Um, I'm going to just really talk through um, four different projects um, that I have worked on. Um, I've been working in the area of sort of digital heritage over the past 10 years, um, but I very much, even though I am involved in the actual development of these products and services, I very much come at this from the idea of um, sort of culture and, um, and primarily I'm following on from what Alan was talking about earlier, questions um, of uh, um, digital, digital literacy, because um, I fundamentally believe, she says pressing the button, oh no that's the wrong button, shall I just, can I just hear it, yeah, um, I'm really interested um, media, any media, I sort of come from the background where um, media is not considered as neutral. So anything that you use, whether you watch something on television will have a very different meaning from how you consume something on a mobile phone to how you consume something in, in, the, in the cinema. So for me, it isn't good enough just to repackage and repurpose media content in these di different digital uh, um, containers. You've got to think about what that digital container adds to the layer of meaning that is being interpreted by your user. And essentially questions of intangible heritage, there's a lot of criticism around the idea that once you start making something digitally, you are, you are reconstructed something. So constructedness becomes part of the experience of someone. And once you start to unpick constructedness, then you start to unpick questions of authenticity. Um, so how does that fit in whenever we create these amazing um, three-dimensional worlds? Um, how does the user perceive them if they are inherently not real? Um, do they present problems around false realism? Um, so this idea that that's a reality that someone else has imagined in the 21st century. So how could you possibly know what it looked like in the 12th century? And then with that comes this sense of distance. You, with these layers of digital technology, are you actually, instead of connecting your user to what it is you're constructing the representation of, are you actually removing them from any sense of realism? Because it's in digital by its very nature is inherently not real. Um, a lot of the projects I've worked on are very much the idea where, you know, spaces and places where the history has largely not there anymore. So how do we construct authentic histories of those places? The place isn't there and the digital technology isn't real. So those are two massive problems. Um, and again, it's just following on from sort of what Alan was saying in that I, I sort of go to a point with my projects where the end point of the project is is with the sort of constructedness of something, the thing that I develop is not the end point for me. I test it. I want to know what the user's response is to that um, to see how that then can change our thinking about the, these um, products. So the first product that I, or the first project that I did, I'm just gonna move this to one side. And then, um, I did this about 10 years ago whenever AR still really was quite unstable. And I grew up in Belfast. Um, so one of our great histories is Titanic. Um, so I found an archive of photographs um, uh, um, of, of the ship um, being built down at the Holland, Holland and Wales site. And I'd have, it, it isn't a huge archive of photographs, um, but I find three photographs from where you could go and stand at the original point from the photograph was taken. So it made sense to me that if you developed an AR browser, you could layer the photograph over that scene and essentially line up the two scenes so you could see um, the ship from where it was built. So that's a picture of me down at Harland and Wolf. There, um, the, the sort of app that I developed, and actually this was sort of pre-app. Um, so the bit of technology um, that I developed took you to the um, Thompson Dry Dock where the ship was built. Um, it opened up the, one of the archive photographs when you were there. And then your challenge was therefore to line it up. So they were using the digital compass inside your phone. You then layered, layered the modern day viewer view with the um, 
you know, history, essentially. And then because, because the ambition was that thinking that this would have some sort of significance to museums and heritage, well, then how could we pack more content into this actual experience? So therefore, I started to use some of the archives where you would never be able to layer the historic view with the real view. And the time I was doing this um, Street Museum London that you might be very familiar with, it was an app that um, that had an awful lot of <laughs> money behind it. I had 8,000 points. Um, it was a project that was done um, with the different museums in London and they layered old sort of photographs, largely of the sort of Second World's bomb destruction in London um, and layered them over the modern day view. And a lot of the branding and marketing literature that came out with that talked about stepping through time. And I can tell you the exhaustive research and um, user testing that I have done on things like this, that just doesn't exist. And I find that very frustrating when that starts to become the language that is used with these projects. There is no sense of time travel with any of these projects. Actually, what is more interesting is the history is brought into the present. You are not transported into the past. And I think that's something really, really interesting to consider in the development um, of these products and you know, services. And one of the most interesting things someone said to me was that rather than taking one person's view of reality in their time, it's taking my view of reality in my time. And it's that something like Alan was talking about early, that's er, earlier, that sense of empowerment. But again, I'm always, when, when, when like someone says that to me, I'm saying, well, what does that mean for the user to be empowered in the digital heritage sector, what does that actually mean for the user? So it's trying to find a, a language and definitions that we can attach to those very emotive and very critical words such as empowerment. Um, so very much whenever you're working with augmented reality browsers that you know history is viewed from a sense of embodiment in the present. It's a search for understanding the past as it is relevant to the present. So being there, being in the 21st century, um, being at the moment in time that you are in is really critical because we understand um, our sort of understanding is formed on all those you know, experiences that we've had up until this moment. So you can't discard them and put them to one side. Whenever you're looking at the past, you bring your experience of the present with you. So that's what just really sort of some of the things that I find interesting um, in terms of augmented reality and the use of augmented reality in projects. Um, step away from time travel. Um, a slightly different approach to, to AR. Um, this is a history space app. Um, we got funding from the MPNA um, to develop an app that is connected to Missenden Temple and Downhill, which is a sort of, it's a it's a, an old ruin that sits on um, the north coast of Northern Ireland. The temple is, um, in, of Missenden is used widely in our branding and promotional literature, our tourism literature. So it's a, it's a sort of significant, iconic um, symbol, but the place is very rarely visited. It's it's access to it is difficult. If you go to the Jan, if you go to Northern Ireland as a tourist, you tend to go to the Jan's Crossway. Um, to get yourself round to Missenden Temple it takes a lot of negotiation in terms of geography. Um, so again, we wanted to use AR in this, but we didn't. But we kind of wanted to do something different with AR. And this was this was you're talking about now around about 2013, 2014. The previous project was 2009, and we sort of we wanted to do something different with AR. Um, and we started to see a lot of apps that we are that were developed at this time had the list, the ubiquitous drop down list. Um, and as a so we were sort of very concerned with interfaces on mobile phones. They're very small. Um, you're trying to condense an awful lot of information into a very small space. So how do you give your user a route through that information in a way that is intuitive? Um, without resorting to providing them with a list of choices. So at this site, you can expect, essentially what we did, we had this idea of literally locking the history within the space. So whenever you open the AR browser, you scan your phone across the landscape to find these sort of ghosted areas. 
And this essentially becomes your portal to the history. Okay. So rather than giving someone a list of eight different experiences, they had to unlock them in the landscape. They had to find them and unlock them. So you find the portal and it says, congratulations, you find the history portal. So you draw a portal and it's sort of the idea of with your phone then, using the gyroscope within the phone, you cut the square in the space. And only once the phone recognizes that gesture, can you does that then information reveal itself to you? So again, it was just an, you know an idea. Again, we have we've we have we developed games, we developed, we put archive content in here. But for us, um, the most significant thing about this project was a different way to think about AR and a different way to think about navigation or navigating digital content in physical spaces and conjoining the two together. Um, it only worked in location. Hey, how you doing? Very well, thanks. Hello. <laughs> I think that was all um, So again, sort of so sure something interesting and different. Again, this is a project um, that has since been lost to the archive and it is one of the things, making notes there when Alan was talking and thinking about ways that we can go back to this project and think about using some of the really valuable assets that we developed through it. We had really imaginative games. There's the black lock where the bishop who lived in this temple used to go fishing. So it was always stocked with fish. So again, you're in a sort of gamification method, using your phone as a fishing reel to cast your line. It then shudders when you have um, the fish has caught the line and then you reel the fish in. So getting the user to explore the space by, by understanding what it would have been like and the different activities that the bishop carried out at the time. Um, so as I say, there is sort of valuable content that we've developed there and it would, it would be useful in thinking sort of how we, how we move that forward. So again, this was really a sort of model of user interface design. That was the whole thinking behind the sort of project. How do you create effective interfaces between digital space places and digital spaces? Um, and again, AR, um, a criticism of AR, um, when you use it in these sorts of settings is that it tends to tilt back um, whenever you view sort of the landscape and the architecture through the frame of the handset. So we wanted to get the user to tilt forward. Um, and it's just really interesting to think about that threshold of the interface between the user and the environment. You have the environment, the user and the phone. How does that relationship work? Um, this is a more recent project. This is Echoes of the Causeway. Again, um, it was a project, it's an app-based project. Um, it was developed to engage users and visitors with those less well-visited places and spaces within our region um, in the north coast of Northern Ireland. Um, again, trying to get the visitors to do something else other than visit the Giant's Causeway. The challenge with these areas are these, um, these different spaces that we chose is there is nothing there. You're lucky if there's a lay-by to park your car, there's no signage. Um, unless you know the history of that place and space, there is, there's no tangible artifacts that would really communicate that to you. Um, so this was the Echoes of the Causeway app. Um, each of those different areas um, was we categorized. So there were sites to see, there were signs to listen to, and the signs were um, stories. We got uh, um, creative writers to write stories about the um, place. And these places are largely connected to myths about fairies, trolls, um, serpents. Um, so lots of imaginative storytelling was the idea that you listen to that in the space. So those were the sounds. And then the secrets were games that you play. So a little interactive game um, that was relevant to the history of the space. But again, to get someone to sort of engage with the, um, with the space in sort of very, very different ways. And again, 
the focus here, I'd say well, every time I come to these projects, I'm always thinking of something different. And this was really, this was about, you've got to involve everyone. This is about storytelling, artists, sound engineers, curators, designers, developers, geographers, um, because heritage needs to be understood from lots of different, but significantly in, interrelated viewpoints. Um, the other thing, there's a reason why that we went for the sort of listen to the stories oh, and myths, stories and myths of these places um, was again this sort of ideology that um, whenever you take a story very literally, you can actually make it less intelligent for your user or less less okay, intelligent. Bye. I suppose every time I move that door, I am um, So if you provide a linear story for someone, that's the only way in which they interpret it. But if you unpack stories through lots of different approaches, then intellectually you make that an awful lot more compelling for your user. So essentially that was something that we were trying to do here. Um, we resist developing any linear only narratives. Um, we also sort of that idea that you don't want to tell someone what to look at. You want to let them find what to look at. Um, and also inherently a lot of these places, what they were looking for were, were our non-visual cultural um, aspects. Stories of fairies that are, are, are part of our myth and legend. Um, they have connection to the space in which you are consuming them, um, but you can't see them. And again, sort of we resisted that ocular centric approach um, where, you know, criticism of heritage where it, it starts with what things look like and then moves forward from that point. Can we start to resist that idea of what things look like? Can we think more intellectually and more creatively from that point? And the last project I'm going to talk about, so this is what I'm working at at the minute. Um, a colleague of mine, Dr. Andrew Snedden, has done a lot of research and written a lot of books about the uh, um, Island McGee witches um, and the witch trial, which took place in Island McGee, um, in, which is in uh, 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 um, County Antrim in 1711. And essentially, there's a, it's a wrap through the story very quickly. Mary Dunbar, um, a, a young woman who lived in the village at the time, claims that she was um, possessed um, and that there were, she pointed to 12 people who she claimed were witches in her community that had performed this demonic possession upon her. So it was the trial of these 12 people. But if you look very, Andrew Snedden's research has looked very closely at the, thing that the people to whom she pointed the finger at. And there were people who essentially um, were on the margins of what is considered conventional society. So there were people who just didn't behave the way society deemed acceptable. Um, people who drank a lot, people who weren't pretty, people who, did, who had, you know, some sort of you know, uh, handicap or deformity. Um, so people who essentially are the other. Um, and so essentially to understand the trial of the Island McGee, which is, is to really get to the core of um, concepts con you know, connected to isolation and persecution. Um, and if you, again, one of the criticisms of um, VR is that VR, once you put the headset on, you're isolated. Um, it physically removes you from things that are normal. So we, we decided that we would actually leverage the very criticisms of the technology itself. That was the whole experience. We wanted somebody to feel isolated, marginalized, the other. Um, so as I say, this is a project sort of still in, still in development just to understand sort of the way we started brainstorming through this. There is nothing there at Island McGee. There is the house in which Mary Dunbar lived, um, but the owner of that house doesn't want visitors anywhere near it um, and has resisted any notion of engaging with anyone who has come to them um, to discuss 
um, concepts of, you know, to some sort of storytelling or her heritage aspect. There is, however, what is called the rocking stone and a lot of the stories about the demonic possessions are, you know, possession of Mary herself sort of are connected to this spot. Um, so we've, we've used this as, as the space um, in which the user then goes into and picks up and engages with various items and artifacts connected to the story. But our starting point from this again, remember is always, how do we want the person wearing the v VR headset to feel? And there's two key strands to this story. One is the sense of being accused. Okay, so you're being persecuted. What does that feel like? And the other sense was, what is it like to be a witch? Um, so these are various artifacts connected to the stories. So for example, if you pick up the broken wine bottle, um, you hear Mary Dunbar's whispered. So essentially you're, you're being othered by Mary Dunbar. Um, so again, that's sort of connected to sort of being a witch. The bonnet again, um, once you touch the bonnet, you become demonically possessed. So you actually levitate in the VR experience itself. So what is it, what would it have been like to, 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 to be Mary, as it were? And then there's the other aspects of sort of the consequence of sort of the pipe, you touch the pipe, the consequence, you, you overhear a heated um, discussion about um, the witches, the so-called witches resisting arrest. So these are all critical. These are historically placed. This has come from Andrew Snedden's research, the histories that all these stories are accurate and true, but we're trying to think about, well, what do we want the person in the VR experience to actually feel from that sensation? So this is some of, oh, it's not coming up very well. This is some of the early uh, um, development work. So this is the sanding stone with the objects littered around it. The other thing we have sitting aside the VR experience is what we're calling the training room, because we do appreciate that if you go in here cold, not knowing the story, you may not understand what it is you're experiencing or why you're experiencing things in particular ways. So you go into the training room first where you pick up various items and archive or that tell you um, a little bit more of the more linear based story um, of the Island McGitch Island McGee witch trial so that you you're able then it helps you to put it into context what it is you feel and experience when you're interacting with the objects at the standing stone. That's me. It's just no one wants to. Hello, uh, Hello. Um, any questions? Yeah. Sorry, Helen. Uh, Helen and I have been together since she's in one of the morning. God, it feels God, like a lifetime now. It's like a lifetime. <laughs> we haven't spoken about the Ireland with the witch trial. Is, mm -hmm. I'm going to talk about that in my presentation as well. Oh, are you? All right, you're very good. I'll leave that. The the, the 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 thing you did on the course, right? What's the course, right? The Echoes of the Course, the right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Who were you working with on that? Helen Perry uh, um, in the museums. The museum, Helen, right? Yeah, we got, um, it was uh, um, Heritage Law Free Funding yeah. to do that. But then it also mixed with um, Wes for Science. I don't know if you've ever come across Wes. He works in our environmental oh. sciences department at the university. So Wes did a lot of the field work that was required to go and find these sites mm -hmm. um, and we had to do a lot of sort of countryside mapping um, so that we could say to visitors park here where good footwear there there are no toilet facilities very simple and straightforward stuff like that as well is it is it continuing or the app is available yeah. to download yeah mm -hmm. It just depends then once the operating system is updated and we don't have any money to respond to those changes, then it's, it's that old question of where do these apps go to down? I have a question um, mm -hmm. and it's more an assumption. The events of the past two years in the pandemic, did you find there was an accelerated uptake in usage of some or all or none of the projects that you worked on? Um, the, the, the sort of echoes of the causeway one, we... Um, we, we just finished that just as COVID was started. So we held it back. We only actually launched it this year. So actually we, we sort of couldn't see a way of getting, of getting that marketing out there online um, during COVID because it was a very 
we didn't know how to do it um, essentially. So, so unfortunately, we're, this this is definitely this is probably a post COVID project. So we're having so much change now. Thank you. Uh, I think on next. Just share my screen here. Okay. Cool. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I uh, my name is Danny O'Toole. I am the head of digital transformation with Mayo County Council, um, local authority on the west coast of Ireland. Um, I am going to, for the next 10 minutes, uh, talk to you briefly about our project Stratus. Um, first, it would be remiss of me not to acknowledge our partners. Um, Alan, you will have seen, uh, so earlier speaking with us, University of St. Andrews, uh, Joan Condell, who uh, was to be with us in person today, but sends her apologies um, from the University of Ulster in, in Belfast. And then obviously Scully, who's the main man here today from the Gunnison Institute in East Iceland. Um, Project Stratus started at the beginning of COVID, I guess, about two years ago. Um, to give it a little bit of context, so we're talking about the culture and heritage aspect of how we can um, implement disruptive technologies like VR in the context of culture and heritage and how we can make it real and, and create that immersive experience that, that people want and expect from modern day technology. Um, just to give it some context, um, as I mentioned, West Coast of Ireland, um, where the, the, the project focus was on Don Patrick Head, um, very scenic coastal area in the northernmost tip of County Mayo, on the westernmost uh, tip of Ireland, um, and uh, just beside a village, a little village in the called Bally Castle, um, a couple hundred people max, but ma maximum, I would think. Um, so. The early stages of this project was um, we kind of took due diligence and did a bit of research and, and, and engaged with the community, a bit like what the president, president of Iceland alluded to earlier on uh, about bringing the people on the journey and, and his PhD student, he talked about him engaging with eight-year-olds and having them part of the journey and develop it through their lens and through, through, through their eyes. We did something similar here. We went to the businesses and the community and, and looked at, we did SurveyMonkey, we did meetings, we did workshops. We conducted all this kind of basic research and just, I'm all, I don't in, in, in endeavor to talk about each of them, but we gathered data um, to find out what the pain points maybe were in the community. And, and some of the findings are interesting that there's a lot of other, you know, what's most important to the economic activities. A lot of rural villages in Ireland are dependent on the local economy and, you know, what drives the local economy and, you know, what stimulates growth and keeps people working in the area and prevents migration and all of those challenges that we've been experiencing for generations in, in Ireland. And the findings are interesting. Uh, let me just move this away from here for a moment. It's essentially focused on two main areas. Um, they felt it's a big farming area, the area that we're talking about. So there's a big emphasis on retaining and maintaining that uh, income in the area. But the other big focus area was tourism. And, and we found that pl pleasing in one way and interesting in another. And we, we talked briefly about how we could use this virtual reality or disruptive technologies in general to promote the local area, promote it, give it a, 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 you know, a wider audience and encourage people to come to the area, either virtually or in person. And we came up with the project uh, concept, and I don't endeavor to read it all, but essentially it was using disruptive technology to change digital literacies, literacies and, in, in, and we energize our towns and villages. And we felt that Ballycastle was a very uh, good candidate for a project like this. So the project overview itself was, and, and, and again, the aims of it was to create a, a uh, virtual reality uh, app or, or experience that would promote Don Patrick Head, that iconic figure, and I'll, I'll show some images in a moment of it, enhance the visitor experience and, and tie it into what was already there and, and supplement what the locals were trying to do um, and, and direct people to the area, either virtually or, or um, 
in person and couple all that together, try and promote economic growth locally because that's what's important to people on the ground. They don't really mind how it gets done as long as the, the, the byproduct is that there's some form of uh, economic growth locally. So um, some of the outputs that we targeted for the project, um, obviously stakeholder engagement was critical, um, getting the message out there, the marketing, the you know, getting the exposure, uh, virtual tour, culture and history. We, we there were, there's many there's many stories that had to be told about this location because it's so steeped in history. Um, this one spot that's maybe a square kilometer or fits within a square kilometer tells several stories of the ages of history. Um, French landing, it was the first point of the French landing in, in the west coast of Ireland. There's many uh, stories of geomorphology, geology, um, culture and heritage. There's a World War II, significant World War II uh, presence there, along with all the other um, bits and pieces. And this is all within a square kilometer. So we were tasked with, I guess, producing a prototype that went some way to telling, tell all those stories in, in a virtual context. Um, and supplement pops all already there. As you can imagine, we were met with many challenges, uh, none more so than the one I care not to mention anymore, um, that you know caused delays and what have you. But when we did get going and we got back on track again, uh, we produced a prototype app within the within the Oculus environment. And I encourage you to uh, join us in the demo area outside after this session and, and get on the Oculus headset and we'll show you what we've done. Certainly the still images I show you here will not do it uh, justice, um, but do join us in a while and we can give you a, a run through what we've done. Um, again, this is a medieval church, a recre digital recreation of a medieval church that sits on that uh, site. Uh, this is a World War II lookout tower, um, manned by two people during World War II, uh, looking out for uh, passing ships, passing planes that were on the way to uh, Germany at the time. Um, again, digital reconstruction of a, of a fort uh, that existed, the ruins of which are still there on, on the site. And that's it there, in a little, little clearer image, and then you the most notable item is the is the sea stack just 46 meters sits 46 meters above the uh above the sea level um and again the surveys that we've carried out indicates that the 46 meters that's above water has a matching 46 meters below water so we've captured all that and we've given a digital recreation of it with the 360 images and the and the photogrammetry information points and telling the story of what goes on there um Again, that's the World War II lookout tower. That's a, a blowhole that runs through the headland. And that's the ruins of the church. And then that's a Air 64 sign that was the identif identification marker for uh, the World War II lookout tower that was there. So the planes that went over the headland saw this 30 meter high letters of Air 64, which is the identification marker. So when they arrived on the coastline, they knew what part of the coastline they hit during World War II. Again, some more images. Um, again, as I said, it doesn't do it justice until you see the, the, the version of it through the Oculus headset. Um, so what we tried to do was create this sort of connected site. So there's many sites like this uh, across the Western seaboard. Um, so with, with, a, with a collaborative approach to culture and heritage, we're looking to do the same with all of the sites locally, nationally, internet, internationally, and we've already, as Alan talked about earlier, the Northern Heritage um, Network that's been created, and you saw some shots of it earlier in the, in the main presentation. The objective here is not to create a, a project that sits standalone and exists just in Mayo. We use all of these technologies, join them all together, sit them on one platform, and allow people to immerse themselves across the entire MPA region. Um, connected virtual experience across the region, and more importantly, connected communities, because a lot of the feedback you get from doing projects like this from the communities, it, it, a lot of them experience, particularly the rural communities, a lot of them experience the same frustrations. So why reinvent the wheel when you can use technology to connect these people okay. together and have them maybe problem solve together and create solutions together that help each other ultimately. 
And that's what I talked about, the connected communities. We have many of these sites along the Western seaboard in, in, in Ireland. We're looking to connect all of them together and broaden the, broaden the connection across the, uh, the MPA region. So, as I said, partnership support, none of this would be possible without um, the partnership support locally um, and nationally, uh, the people and businesses in Ballycastle, County Mayo, an integral part of the success of this prototype of this project. Uh, Falls Ireland are a national uh, tourism agency. Uh, my own company, Mayo County Council, Balnamia has predicted, and obviously the political representation is a, is a key thing to promoting it and, and getting exposure to it nationally, politically, particularly in the political circles. Um, obviously, climate change is a factor. Um, and, and one of the things I alluded to is, is uh, someone asked me recently, well, why, why do you have past, present and future uh, on your Stratus logo? Well, what I've just talked about is the first iteration of what we think this project could look like in the future. So um, climate change is a hot topic at the moment and it's everybody's business and it's, 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 it's our business to, to make a difference in this area. So when we talk about past, present, future, we think maybe future iterations of this project could be using AR um, to look at things like rising sea levels, um, climate change, you know, show me what the, the, the cliff face at Don Patrick Head looked like 100 years ago. Show me what it looks like now. Now show me what it might look like in 100 years time, 100 years time at the current projections of the rising sea levels. Things like that create opportunities for education around climate change in the local schools and the local communities and, and create awareness because climate change is a big part of it is awareness and, and education. Um, technology will only go so far, but that's what we kind of envision the future roadmap of this project to be is, is target climate change and target the, the, the effects of it if it continues to go the way it's going. Um, just some contact details if you want to look us up online. All of our uh, uh, website and social media presences are there. There's lots of videos. There's lots of you know engagement stuff there that you can play with. And uh, feel free to come chat to me afterwards. Thank you. I'm going to ask if there's any questions. Uh, I don't mind if there's not. I should acknowledge actually that a. Uh, this, some of this digital reconstruction was, was uh, a big uh, part of that was uh, Ian um, is a PhD student in the, in the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. He was an integral part of, of all of those uh, digital reconstructions that you saw there. And, and Ian is an expert in all things VR, as is Alan. Okay, moving swiftly on. Um, my... Next speaker and last one, but by no means by no means least, is uh, Graham Thompson. He's the CEO of Causeway Coast and Glen Heritage Trust. Brilliant. Let me cue your presentation, Glen. Yeah. Just set this here and set yours. You can take mine. Thank you. Glen Thompson. Thank you very much. This is the. I don't believe it works. But you can try oh, so it's just keyboard. Keyboard. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and good afternoon, Ian and Alan. If you're still there, um, it's a pleasure to be here, and thanks to Scully and Joan um, Cundell for the in invitation. Um, I thought I was in a different session. Um, there's a man called Stuart Massey who's next door who's going to be telling you all, telling people all about the technical stuff relating to the Northward or the story tagging project and the, the Northward platform. So if anybody's watching this online in the future or the recording, go and see Stuart's presentation first and then follow up with this because what I'm going to be talking about is more of the tourism elements of this, 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 this group and um, a lot of the work we're involved with in tourism, particularly with the Northwood project, but also with another NPA project. So, um, 
I'm from the Causeway Coast and Glens Heritage Trust, and I'm, I'm going to I'm going to move that away from Northern Ireland because that would be pretty inappropriate at this day and age, wouldn't it? Um, we are situated in Northern Ireland. You see the map of Ireland there, which has a very soft red border between the greener Republic of Ireland and, and, and the north. Um, the Irish Sea border is on the right hand side that you see, but we operate in the northern and eastern part of Northern Ireland. And you see the area on the, on the map between us from almost Belfast in the south, from Island McGee all the way around the Glens of Antrim, across the Causeway coast and into the Benevna area in the northwest. And actually, um, Danny, we have people from work who would like to talk to you about some of the, the military work that you've done because we are funded, being funded by our Heritage Lottery Fund um, to undertake a thing called the Benevna Landscape Partnership Scheme. And the central theme of that is defence heritage, so World War One, World War II and many other things. What we do as an organisation, we are like a national park authority with our teeth. So our, our central work is protected, managing protected landscapes, and um, I'm not going to go into that today. Um, but we do have a responsibility for promoting sustainable tourism in the, in the Causeway Coast and Glens area. That isn't just the Causeway Coast and Glens Borough Council, which was referred to in, by Helen in her presentation, but also the Mid and East Antrim uh, Borough Council, which is in the area um, to the south of that. Um, from a tourism perspective, uh, we support Tourism Northern Ireland in their promotion of the Causeway Coastal Route, which I'll come back to. Um, but other things we do are running um, uh, uh, an events program, which is for not for not a heavily tourist or people focused um, events program, but has a lot of heritage from a, a landscape perception perspective, but a, also a cultural perspective. Um, we do a lot of promotion uh, to protect our special places because they are central to our tourism product. Um, we do a lot of work in provision of access, um, new walkways, new paths, promoting um, walking walking routes. Um, we do a lot of training for tour guides and storytellers, which I'll, which I'll come back to. And we have been managing two NPA programs. Um, as a result of one of them, we are, um, are running a network called the Economy Museum Network, which we'll come back to, and also um, story tagging stroke northward. So, the Causeway Coastal Route runs from um, Belfast in the in the south to Derry, London Derry in the in, in, in the northeast, and it's the number one tourist um, attraction area in Northern Ireland. And um, there's a number of iconic places: um, the Gobbins, which is on Island McGee. Island McGee comes back and back. Um, the Glens of Antrim, um, the Nine Glens of Antrim. There is Fairhead, uh, Rathlin Island, our only inhabited. Um, island off the Northern Irish coast, Carrick Reed Rope Bridge, um, an iconic location built by salmon fishermen, the Giants Causeway, Dunlis Castle, and again, um, repeating some of the stuff that um, Helen was talking about earlier on, um, Downhill Estate with Mussenden Temple on the shore, right um, overlooking um, Benone Strand. Due to the, our involvement in the Northern Periphery Programme, um, we have been responsible for promoting a network of artisans who are working to try and improve their, 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 their lot and develop their products. Um, um, on the whole, micro businesses who are diversifying into tourism. And from the, from the West, there's Breuter Gold, who are a, a rapeseed man manufacturer. Um, in our Ballycastle area, there's more repeats in this area, we have um, the... Um, the, the butcher, um, uh, which is a, which is a gold form, which which butchers so made. The baker, um, which is Ursa Minor um, Bakery in Ballycastle. A hurling stick maker in Loch Hale, um, Michael Scullion. Um, we also have um, a, a smokehouse, um, uh, a, a microbrewery, um, a nice cream maker, um, a, a forge. Um, one of the best jewelers in Northern Ireland, Steenson's involved, and in the Island McGee area, um, Gobbins Crafts and um, Audrey Kyle, who is a watercolorist, and remember the name Audrey Kyle, especially you, Helen. Um, these are some of the stills that we have of the, the work done. 
Le Leonor, who is from Brother Gold, um, Michael making his hurling sticks, uh, Nigel's beer from, um, from Randallstown, the wonderful cakes from Ursa Minor, and um, the, the, the goat, which is probably not with us anymore. Um, so we have been involved in the Northward programme. Um, it was an NPA project um, which was started, developed maybe, maybe five or six years ago. And we tried um, under the leadership of Robert uh, um, RGU in Aberdeen to, 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 to get over the line and promote a project. We missed the vote the first time we tried. We missed the vote the second time we tried um, and finally got it in for the, the final call of the last round of NPA, which is likely to be the, the final call that um, any of us from the United Kingdom are allowed to, um, to go do. Um, the project is about supporting creative, creative industries to bring culture in various forms to a wider audience using um, digital technology, using video, using all different sort of techniques. And the whole process started with a collection of stories. And um, we engaged um, a well-known local story, Liz Weir, to go out collecting stories. Um, and there were many, many people came forward with, with, with stories. Um, and the stories were amassed in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a central database. The second stage was asking creatives to look at those stories um, and see if they could come up with any ideas or any, any suggestions on, on how they can work with the stories and, 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 and come forward with new, um, new, new products and the like. Um, and also working with the people to try and diversify into in the, in the tourism provision. So the five, the six artist suite we have is a Michelle McGarvey, who is a, um, an art teacher at a school in Coleraine. She came and identified with a story about a, a Selkie. So for the non-Irish members of the audience, a Selkie is like an, an Irish mermaid, um, not quite, but um, a, a, a woman who appears from the sea um, sheds her sheds sheds her skin and acts and lives like like a human. Um, it's a woman called Kate um, McFall. Kate Murphy developed a story on the uh, on the Selkies, and as a result of that, uh, Michelle was worked with others to come up with uh, new artworks and art designs based on 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 on, on the Selkie story. Um, haha! No, she didn't. That was Angela taking them. Um, that's that's Angela's selkie cloak um, um, and uh, uh, Angela there. Um, Colin Irwin is an interesting character. He um, brought forward a story um, which was about something called the Armada tree and the Spanish Armada, which left A, a Coruña. Um, um, our friend Jorge, who is with us today, left A Coruña yesterday on Monday morning and managed to make it to Iceland in time for the the first part of the week. Um, the Francis Drake famously destroyed most of the Armada. They fled around the coast of Scotland, onto the Irish coast, um, and down to County Mayo, I believe, where there's um, remnants of the of the Armada. But there's a story in um, which which Colin collected that the um, the Armada the there was somebody who died uh, after coming off the of one of the ships and had a Spanish chestnut in his, in his, um, in his trouser pockets. He was then, um, um, he died, he was buried and where he was buried, a chestnut tree grew and grew and grew and lived for 400 years um, and fell um, within the last, last decade or so. So Colin wrote, collected the story and actually used his story to come up with a product, which is, which is a song, which is released on as a video. Likewise, um, there's, a, there's a company from um, Valley Castle called Tazy Turning, who actually took part of that chestnut tree and started making wooden things, including um, sort of carvings of a, um, a, an Armada galleon, which is great. Um, Sasha McVeigh. Um, Sasha is a ceramicist, and there was a, a story collected on, on Rathlin Island. Um, and I'll just come find a bit of this for you if you bear with me a second. 
um, by a member of the McFall family as well. And instead of doing a, a story, she uh, she wrote a poem. And I'll, I'll read a, a little bit about out, 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 out of this, not the, the, the full thing, because I've, I've been told and I've told people that the best sort of poems are short poems. Anyway, it's called The, the Lighthouse Keeper's Cottage. And uh, three short verses in the middle were, between the windings of the winch, they'd flavor soups with just a pinch of this or that kept in the cupboards, never empty like Mrs. Hubbard's. The cupboards had a lot of shelves divided by the men themselves in the cut bees for ready stocks, or whatever they fancy from their tucker box. The cupboard and the dresser too, filled with stripy china blue, were central to the keepers' lives who lived alone without their wives. So Sasha got inspiration from this poem and developed a, a range of pottery, um, which was resonant of the West Lighthouse in Rathlon. Um, it's the, the white and blue of, of, of the pottery, and she's, she's now developed this as a, as, a, as a product for sale and will use digital techniques, et cetera. And there's, there's Jorge, who you must have heard us talking about, uh, Acarunia Jorge. <laughs> um, finally, um, the, the final um, creative are a uh, musical duo, duo called Foxen. Audrey Kyle, who I mentioned earlier on, was the watercolors from, from Island McGee, collected a story on the witches of Island McGee. Okay, so um, I, was, I was gonna tell you something about the, the witches of Island McGee, but um, Helen has done it much more eloquently than I have, uh, I, I, than I could. And so the, the, the two girls, Becky and a friend, have come up with a, um, with a, with a song as a, as a result of this. And if I can end the presentation and find um, the, the video, I think it's probably a good way to end. Agree? No, that's the... Is it, that's, that was... That was <laughs> North word. Set again, sorry. It may have to be reshared for the online. Right, okay. It's just um, Actually, no. I'll tell you what I'll do. If I um strangely name Vox Voxen, the VOK. The place you're going after this is called Vok VOK, which is the spa bath in um and do you think that will play if I press that?
Thank you, Graham. Um, very insightful. Any questions either from our online participants or those of us in the room? It would appear you're off the hook, Graham. Um, that, ladies and gentlemen, concludes this session. Um, those of you that are online will have to redirect to the link at the top of the program for the main uh, closing remarks by Scully in the auditorium. So we're taking a break here now um, and we're back in the auditorium, I think, for 3 30. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask you, are you all from the same place?